Okay, so this is episode two of my uh, YouTube experiment, and today what I want to do is I wanted to talk about what I have long thought is, in fact, one of the most important concepts in the contemporary environment and uh, one of the least uh, talked about and least well understood. And this is the, the distinction between rivalrous goods or rivalrous phenomena and anti rivalrous phenomena. Um, I think this. This concept by itself, if, if fully grasped, um, may be the most important one out there. So on that note, let's start. Um, so the rivalrous is pretty straightforward. Uh, it consists of things like hamburgers and glasses of water and oil, where uh, if I have it, you don't have it. And if I have consumed it, then it's gone forever. Right? So these are fundamentally, fundamentally uh, not shareable and fundamentally entropic kinds of things. And it's, I think it's fair to say that most, if not all, of our economic structures and to a great extent many of our legal and political structures for, say, the past 15,000 years have been about trying to solve the problem of how do we most effectively, which sometimes means most equitably and sometimes it means most productively um, generate and distribute rivalrous goods, right? I mean, for most of human history, the problem of how do we feed people uh, has been the problem. Um, with our contemporary, or at least say late 70s, economic and political structures being the most effective figured out thus far. Now, the, the anti-rivalrous is very importantly, completely different in kind. Um, it is uh, that set of things where if I have it, you can also get a completely functional copy of it without me losing it at all. And actually, even more importantly, the more people who have it, the more valuable it becomes. Um, you know, the canonical example here would be something like, say, language uh, or a telecommunications network like the internet. You know, if I'm the only person who speaks Esperanto, it's not worth anything. Um, but if I teach you Esperanto, which has some cost, but the cost of that is, uh, is minuscule compared to the cost of creating the language in the first place, um, it gets more valuable. And of course, every additional person who gets added to the network increases the value of the network exponentially. Right? So this Metcalfe's law and a, sort of a more fundamental notion of what kinds of things intrinsically participate in Metcalfe's law. Okay, so the, the first insight, once you have this distinction, is to recognize that uh, a lot of the deep concepts that, that we apply and use to make good choices in the domain of the rivalrous actually don't work at all in the domain of the anti-rivalrous for deep reasons. Uh, so for example, let's take the microeconomic concepts of supply and demand and the price function. In a, a rivalrous domain where the cost of production is um, asymptotically related in some fixed way to the value, meaning that uh, even though you can get more and more efficient at, say, producing a car, the production of a car has some fixed, relatively thick cost. Um, and as a consequence, there is a point at which uh, it just doesn't make sense to make more cars. The incremental marginal value of a new car is less the incremental marginal value, uh, sorry, marginal cost of creating a new car. And this is going to be characteristic, characteristic of all kinds of rivalrous phenomena. There's just a crossover point where it costs too much to make more uh, in the relationship to the amount of value uh, that you can generate out of it. Um, and, and there seems to be an intrinsic decreasing returns to scale so that any, in any given technological framework, um, you can squeeze a certain amount of efficiency out of your production path, uh, and then you reach uh, an asymptotic limit. Um, now, of course, we, we can continually move into new kinds of technological frameworks, and we'll speak about that in a moment. Um, but once you're in one, that's where you're stuck. And in this context, the price function actually ends up being a perfectly efficient way of identifying what is the appropriate uh, combination of where an individual should point their attention, meaning 
if I want to figure out what I should do, all I have to do is look for the places where I can make the most money. If the economy says that I make more money being a uh, elementary school teacher or being a coal miner, um, then that's what I should do, at least within the, the domains of what microeconomics can accomplish. And also, it serves as the mechanism for motivation of that same behavior. Right? So if I want to buy stuff, then I need money. And the way that I get money is by doing the stuff that the economy says uh, is of value. And so this is orthodox uh, economics. And at least within the domain of the rivalrous, it more or less works. I mean, there's a lot of fuzziness outside of the notion of a perfect economy, but um, it's still good, good theory. And the price function is uh, effective. Now, the problem is, is that it doesn't work at all in the anti rivalrous And this is, I think, important. It's not that it doesn't work a little bit. We can kind of collude it to make it work. Um, it's actually the opposite direction. So, for example, we have tried to collude it. Uh, the entire concept of intellectual property, the notion of uh, creating rivalrousness, creating scarcity around fundamentally anti rivalrous things like ideas, uh, is our effort to shoehorn the anti rivalrous into rivalrous legal, economic, and political frameworks. Um, so how do we tell people how valuable it is to create new ideas? Well, if all we've got is uh, supply and demand of the price function, we have to turn these new ideas into the functional equivalent of a barrel of oil, into the functional equivalent of a ham sandwich. There's only so much that can go around. It's scarce, and so the price function works. Uh, the problem is, since the, the marginal cost of copying, uh, say, something like calculus, is effectively de minimis, it's effectively zero. And the marginal value is not just the value that inures to the individual who gets it, right? So there, if I don't know calculus is value to me of me learning calculus, but there's also the Metcalf's law, which is that calculus in general gets more valuable to literally everyone than more people who have it. Um, so what that means is that, um, to put a very fine point on it, uh, you should be willing to pay me to learn calculus, at least some amount. And in fact, as a community, we should be collectively willing to pay effectively anyone to learn calculus because the, the net net value to the whole, to the community, uh, is going up exponentially. And the marginal cost of learning it uh, is, uh, in fact, asymptotically going down. There's some flat level and there's specific reasons, which has to do with the relationship between the rivalrous and the anti rivalrous um, I guess if you followed me this far, it might be worth diving into that a little bit. I apologize that this is getting a bit convoluted. Um, I don't have enough skills in video to edit this. So this is all being taken in one splurge. Um, so we talked earlier about the notion of the way that you might move from one technical regime to another technical regime. And right now we're focused on what are the actual limits of, of where the anti rivalrous doesn't reduce to zero copying costs. Um, and this is, is just where those two pieces relate. So the anti rivalrous is how we innovate and develop new technical regimes. So when a given rivalrous economy shifts to a new fundamental capacity, it does so on the basis of some anti-rivalrous innovation. And somebody invents, invents the wheel, somebody invents the steam engine, somebody invents electricity, um, which is an anti-rivalrous phenomenon that changes the underlying basis upon which the entire rivalrous economy operates. Right? So that's one side of it. Uh, innovation waves are the anti rivalrous feeding back on the rivalrous. Um, contrary wise, the amount of, of irreducible energy that is uh, necessary for a copy of the anti rivalrous to be written to a, an agent um, is the, the rivalrous constraining the, uh, the uh, effectiveness or the, the propagation of the anti rivalrous. So, um, you know, if, if it takes a human being, say, a year, to learn uh, Chinese, then the amount of actual rivalrous energy of feeding that individual, housing that individual, and maintaining the integrity of their intention, and the opportunity cost of doing just that is the rivalrous substrate against which the anti-rivalrous is working. <clears throat> okay, so now we get to the last point. Why is this the crown jewel? Um, well, you might be able to guess. So the the anti-rivalrous um, is the crown jewel because of this uh, exponential. It is the thing that causes the exponential to show up at all. Uh, that once you've developed, once one person has done the work of developing calculus, it is almost free for everyone else, which means that the next group of people who are coming don't have to reinvent calculus. They just learn it. 
and then they get to use it and then they get to innovate on top of it. So rather than constantly investing most of your energy and merely reproducing a constant state, every iteration of generativity is building on a effectively free existing state. And this of course is what generates exponentials. Now, if you take that fact and you combine it with the recognition that our entire social, economic, and legal infrastructure is currently optimized for the rivalrous, you then see the opportunity. If we can figure out how to construct a social framework which is optimized for the anti-rivalrous, you should expect to see a rather dramatic increase in anti-rivalrous generation. And of course, when you're on an exponential, any increase is a massive increase. I mean, any shift to the right, if you could move, like imagine if you were able to teleport your portion of society to 2025 um, next year. So everybody else is at 19, 2019 and you're at 2025 in terms of comparative technological capability. Um, well, that's a decisive strategic advantage. I mean, you just have exponentially more capability than people who didn't make that move. So an appropriately designed anti-rivalrous civilization toolkit reaches escape velocity vis-a-vis -vis the sum total of all rivalrous civilizations. That's it. That's the key idea.